Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Uh, welcome to LMU CBA's special lecture series. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management, and also the director of Center for International Business Education, often called the SIBE, using the acronym at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. LMU is one of 16 universities in the country that has received prestigious side grants. So the LMU side serves as regional as well as national resources to help U.S. companies and industries enhance global competitiveness. To fulfill this mission, LMU side has been offering special lecture series on key international business topics that have significant implications for U.S. businesses. Today's webinar covers one of the most important and timely topics in this digital age, that is cybersecurity. October 2024 marks the 21st Cybersecurity Awareness Month declared by the U.S. President and Congress. Our government and industry work together to increase cybersecurity awareness, encourage actions by the public to reduce online risk, and generate discussion on cyber threats on a national as well as global scale. As you all know, the global cyber threat continues to increase at a rapid pace with a rising number of data breaches each year. As information technology has become critical in competing in the global market, governments as well as companies should be more proactive to protect digital data, transactions, and networks. Today, a panel of cybersecurity professionals will discuss how AI advancements are redefining cybersecurity strategies and the companies find ways to cultivate a proactive security culture. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, my colleague, Professor Greg Lontog. Professor Lontog has over 20 years of experience as a technology leader and educator. He co-founded Global Wide Media, which is an affiliate and programmatic digital advertising platform. As chief technology officer, he has held different positions spanning programming, system administration, and data science. Now as a clinical assistant professor of information systems and business analytics at LMU, Professor Lantog helps students build the skills needed for today's and tomorrow's workplace. Greg, I'd like you to take it over from here and introduce our panelists, and you can start a panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Young Sun. So I actually wanted to start, why are we here? So what is the objective today? Well, as we know, there are many inflated expectations surrounding AI as possibly the silver bullet for our business problems. But is AI enough to protect our businesses, especially our own data and customer data? So today, as Youngson mentioned, we have a panel of cybersecurity experts, and these experts have decades of hands-on experience across multiple industries and roles, and they're going to help us unpack and answer this question. We'll, along the way, explore the popular trust zero trust model that many organizations are adopting, and then also look into how we can help build a more resilient cybersecurity culture to keep businesses globally competitive. But to all the attendees, make sure you stay tuned until the end of the panel discussion, where we'll talk about cybersecurity roles that don't require a technical background, perfect for those non-technical business majors or really anyone looking to break into this in-demand field. So I'm gonna now introduce our experts. So first up is Chuck Lurch. Welcome, Chuck. In Chuck's previous roles as CIO and CTO for numerous companies, he focused heavily on security. He's also worked with the Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Administration. And nowadays, Chuck is the CEO of CyberUptive, a provider of managed cybersecurity services and the only locally owned and operated 24-7 security operations center in Hawaii. So welcome, Chuck. Thanks. Of course. And our second panelist with the same last name, Anne-Marie Lurch, co-founded Hitech Hui, 
the parent company of Cyberruptive. And her and her husband co-founded this company, Chuck. And she wears many hats on the business side from marketing, finance, and many more, earning her the title of CXO, which means chief of everything, a title she shares with her business partners. Anne-Marie leverages her many years of consulting and business intelligence experience at companies like Microsoft, Accenture, and Zappos. So welcome, aloha, Anne-Marie. Aloha, thank you for having me. All right. Our next panelist is Mark Macias. Welcome, Mark, who has 20 plus years of experience securing various organizations like Disney, Southern California Edison, PG&E, and UCLA Health. And Mark shares a similar mission as I do to mentor this next generation. He is a lecturer at Cal State LA, and he is the cybersecurity program lead and lecturer at East LA College. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. And rounding out our panel is one of our very own, Stephen Cook, a 2018 LMU College of Business graduate. Stephen is a manager of cloud security at SADA working to help secure organizations who are on the Google Cloud platform. SADA is a six-time Google Cloud Partner of the Year winner, too. Uh, Stefan has extensive experience ranging from developing large-scale security architectures to helping clients build cloud security teams from the ground up. And then he was also in the very first class I taught here at LMU. So welcome back, Stefan. Good to be here. Thank so you. thank you to all the panelists for being here with us. So the plan today is we'll have a panel discussion for about an hour. Then we'll have time for audience Q&A. And you can submit your questions using the Q&A box at, on your taskbar. So Hugo just mentioned that right now. And then we'll get to them in the last part of our event. So you can submit your question as questions arise. And if anything comes up during our discussion that is maybe unfamiliar to you, perhaps you can use AI to understand the topic at hand. It's kind of like you're reading a book, you come across something, look it up. And then if still unanswered, we'll address it in the Q&A. All right. So speaking of Q&A, of AI, to kick things off for our first question, I'm going to look to you, Chuck, first. How is AI being used to detect and prevent cyber threats? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think uh, we're still very early on. Uh, in this space to look for the, uh, I guess we're still very early on. A lot of the companies that we work with, like CrowdStrike and Mandy and everybody else, they're starting to use AI, but again, it's responsible AI. So not just throwing it out there because it is a cybersecurity tool. Uh, so again, we are seeing like, so CrowdStrike's got Charlotte, if you guys want to look up that. Uh, Sentinel-1's got Purple. Uh, Trellix, which used to be FireEye, is using, oh, what's their new one called? Um, I forget what it is, but you see it out there in all the marketing. Oh, Wise, they're using Wise. That's based off of Amazon Bedrock. So what they're doing right now is uh, they're all trying to get to this AI analyst type thing where they help existing IT and security analysts kind of remediate um, threats, right? So like, is this real? Is it not real? And so they're actually, the AI is actually to do machine things better than humans can. And then the humans use their brains to actually like rationalize all the data. Right. So it's a different way to look at doing things. That's where it's at today. Um, in the way we're looking at things early on, you had AI silence is the first big player in the market. Right. Silence came out. Oh, gosh, seven years ago, maybe longer, but they changed the landscape. That was more machine learning, the whole precursor to all of this. But that really it changed the game. So. Gotcha. So can you give examples of how they're sure. exactly using it? So can you walk us through a particular use case or a more popular use case? Well, let's go back to the original like um, machine learning stuff back in the day, like, you know, maybe when Silence first came out. So it used to be, so before then it was always signature based and you'd have to have the latest signatures to stop viruses from going through your network. Uh, when Silence came out, they said, you know, we're not going to have signatures. It's just going to be this AI or machine model saying, if this file is bad or it looks like it's going to do bad things and quarantine it right away, uh, that changed the whole landscape of the cybersecurity industry just in that, in that one piece, right? Fast forward, now you have your, your leaders like CrowdStrike and everybody else are actually looking at all the data coming in from your firewalls, 
endpoints and all these other telemetry pieces and saying, this is the needle in the haystack that we're looking for. So for example, for Trellix, uh, we use their SEM, of course, um, and that's using Amazon Bedrock. So it's taking all the source data from all these different pieces inside your network and, and literally trying to burn down the haystack to find the needle, right? Much faster than analysts trying to piece all this stuff together and say, well, this looks bad and this looks bad, or this looks okay. But when you have all these little fires it actually creates an incident, so, or it creates an investigation. So it's making that happen much faster. So we're actually able to get to the answers. This is bad, yes or no, much faster. Sorry, that was a long answer, but. Yeah, it's trying to find those. I had to think through it. Yeah, I had to think through that one. Can I add to that, Greg? Please. Yes. So, uh, of course, everything uh, that was just said is, uh, Chuck just said is true. Uh, but on a more general uh, sense, um, uh, yeah, AI is used to analyze large data sets, right? Mm -hmm. And within cybersecurity, uh, and I've implemented a couple of, um, a few SOC operations, uh, a security operation center has in it a SIM a tool. That's a security yeah. and an event management tool. And that tool is responsible for gathering all the logs on every device in the organization and analyzing those logs. Well, now that you have AI and, and the analyst is usually the tool itself and the intelligence in the tool and the security analyst sitting at the SOC operation center. Now with AI, AI can analyze that data a lot quicker, uh, freeing up the SOC analyst to do more, uh, as Chuck said, more you know, uh, rationalization and, 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 and response to, uh, to real incidents. The AI will will um, will eliminate all the noise and get to the true incidents. Uh, well, we hope we'll get to the true incidents. Uh, yeah, as Chuck yeah. said, we're I don't think we're one hundred percent there yet, and it's still maturing. But that's the intent, and that is uh, one reason why companies fear that. While well, cybersecurity, the industry feel, fears from an employment perspective that there are going to be a need for less. Uh, less um, security analysts because now AI is going to be able to pick up some of the slack. Yeah, at the heart of it, it's data, right? So maybe it's better data analysts, right? Knowing what to do with the data with the mindset of cybersecurity as the domain. Uh, Stefan, what are you seeing on your end on the client side? Are they how are they using AI? Yeah, I think yeah, as you know, a couple couple of folks said, it is still relatively early on. But really what I'm seeing uh, is AI for context attainment. So a lot of times, especially if you're in a SIM, um, you're overwhelmed with information and IPs and hashes and all this data. And you essentially have to determine if something is worth uh, investigating or not. So uh, I personally work in Google's uh, SIM called Google SecOps now. Um, and what they do is they have an AI tool that summarizes um, kind of disparate information and helps tell a story. It's literally like a paragraph with clickable links that gives you a story of how, uh, you know, what is happening in your environment, what kinds of commonalities they're seeing between, you know, threat detections, et cetera, and, you know, if it's worth investigating. And then there's always a, one thing with AI, and since we are kind of in the early days with it, there's a handoff where AI can't do everything. Like AI can only do so much. So that, that's where we see these analysts um, actually use this information to determine if they should dive into something or if they can kind of throw the alert away. So definitely seeing like really good context attainment with AI. That's definitely the first step. Um, I'm also seeing it for um, two more things. So detecting malicious activity patterns and attackers. So kind of going into that data problem, there's tons of data um, that tie, you know, data out there um, that, you know, identifies malicious, uh, behaviors and attackers and fingerprints, et cetera. You can use AI to find that needle in the haystack where that information might be in your log data, um, to see if, you know, malicious activity is happening. Uh, and then similar to that insider threats. So this has traditionally been a really tough nut to crack for security folks. Um, cause insider threats, like you're not always like planning or, you know, detecting and preventing risk from inside your organization. Well, with AI, you can actually look at usage trends with all your, you know, employees and see if someone's trying to like log into something um, or, you know, pseudo or gain privileges that they weren't, that they 
haven't been doing or they're doing it to a kind of a, a strange amount. Um, so you're able to find these trends and patterns with all the data you have um, to see if there is insider threat activity. So that's the main main things I'm seeing. Yeah, lots of different use cases, still early days. Uh, so Anne-Marie, I wanted to ask you, coming from the business side, what do you think is the right way to market an AI-based cybersecurity solution? Or do you not even use AI as a selling point? Actually, it's funny that you it's funny that you say that because <laughs> we were just recently at trade shows and normally whenever we go to trade shows, we always regroup and we say, okay, what did we learn? What are we seeing in the market? What are they doing that works? And I wasn't at the last trade show, but uh, I believe Chuck was there and they said, everybody's using the a the word AI, whether they're using it or not. It's just been a buzzword that people are using in marketing, even though they may not even be using AI the right way or using AI at all, but they're putting it in their marketing. So we are seeing that the term is being used sometimes not even correctly. I mean, they're mm -hmm are being marketed as AI and it's really not AI. Um, however, we have started to, tr to attempt to weave it into our marketing. However, we are using AI, AI. We are starting to use AI within our SOC as well. So legitimately, we are trying to weave it in, but um, we know that that's a buzzword that we're, we're definitely putting into our marketing. It's a good, good caution, right? It's the, it, was, it was big data before, now it's yeah. AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so also on the other hand, AI can help us, you know, understand context, figure out anomalies, look at insider threats, but AI can also be used to create cyber threats, right? So there's this gen AI movement and it's creating <laughs> new threats. Uh, do you have any stories or do you see any patterns there that we should be aware of? Uh, sure. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'll go first. Uh, so. What we are seeing, we are definitely seeing the increase of, in, of attacks. And before the attackers would move, you know, there was a cadence to how fast they would move, but we are seeing them move a lot faster. And I can't say without a shadow of a doubt, it's definitely AI driven, but the way they're moving and the, and the intensity of, of the way the attacks are happening now, um, definitely like, that's, it's definitely very suspect because it's just, they're just moving so much faster. Um, so we're, and I think what we're going to also see is, and the same way we're in defenders, um, and some of the other people we do talk to on the, on the offensive side is, so let's say you're a target at LMU. So we're going to know everything about you. So as soon as that vulnerability, we know everything about your network. As soon as there's a vulnerability published for your, for whatever you're using inside your network, we know how to attack you right away. And then automatically just go do it. So we're starting to see a massive uptick and, and it's just not the uptick, it's the intensity. That we're seeing um, just as they get into the network and just goes like wildfire. I, I'd like to jump in here too. The interesting part though, when you look at the business and marketing side, right? So yeah. let's say we we find a vulnerability and we're excited because we're finding things before other companies are. And I'm thinking yeah. we post this, you know, we we gotta we gotta tell the public about it. And then our my the technical team is saying no, you can't because then the hackers are going to know that we know how to protect how to protect them and they're going to get smarter. So that's, those are the challenges that we're experiencing on the, on the marketing side. Yeah. We sound like we found a new ransomware variant. Right. And it's like, oh, this, I'm like, no, 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 no. They can't, no. They can't let the bad people know that we know. Right. So we let the right people know that we know, but not the bad people. If that makes sense. Yeah. Fine balance. <laughs> uh, Mark Seffen. How, have you encountered this, these Gen AI cyber threats, perhaps, or this increased intensity? Maybe it's allowing them to move laterally faster? Yeah, I haven't personally um, experienced it yet, uh, because again, it's hard to tell if it's AI or not, right? Exactly. And, um, so it, it's speculative, but um, but I've read, read a lot of use cases on it, and so it, apparently it is increasing. And now we have to figure out how to defend against AI. So perhaps use AI against AI, right? So uh, that that's kind of my next charter uh, from a cybersecurity perspective is to figure out how to defend against AI and how to uh, how to use uh, deploy AI to better our our our, uh, our security. Yeah, let me just add on to that. Uh, I think one. You know, one thing I'm first, so personally, I haven't seen any like AI based attacks, but I have read about scenarios where the data 
uh, that an AI model is using has been poisoned, which can produce some, you know, bad results or, um, you know, taking like do bad things with the queries, et cetera. So, you know, that does kind of push the message of thinking of AI, uh, the AI infrastructure as a risk surface. Um, I think that's definitely something, you know, while everything's getting, you know, more, you know, modern and, um, you know, data, data driven and everything, we still have to remember that the data is housed in a database somewhere. So you have to protect the underlying infrastructure as well. Um, so I think that's kind of coming to the forefront a little bit more as we're seeing this proliferation of AI. It's becoming a data security problem. Yeah, going back to the data, yeah, it's hard to tell if, if it's AR or not, right? And so I kind of want to move to this idea of the zero trust model. Uh, so Mark, I know you have a lot of experience in identity and access management. For the uninitiated, can you just explain what zero trust is from a bird's eye view? Well, from bird's eye view is is really uh, has to do with um, with with network segmentation, right, and firewalling, and making sure that when you move between networks, that only those who need to be in the network or, or in the segment are are in the segment. Uh, and and so, uh, from my perspective, it's always been uh, you know controlling lateral movement. It, once you've gotten inside the network and and making sure that you know who can get between your different segments. That's at, my... at Cyber Eruptive, uh, how do you, do you guys use this model or how do you apply oh. it? Which of the pillars do you apply? I'm sure you do, but which of the ones do you focus on and prioritize? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think first off with Zero Trust, it means a lot of things. So the vendors, I, we always go back to marketing, right? The vendors, you know, zero trust was the other buzzword a couple of years ago, right? And there, and there is a real model around it, but you have all these vendors like uh, the firewall vendors that say, no, we do zero trust. And you have the application vendors say, no, we do zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. So as a practitioner, Mark, as you guys know, and uh, Stephen, that you have to really explore and understand what zero trust is. And then um, I say that to all the, everybody out there in the audience as well is to do your own research to, so you understand what zero trust is um, from a business case and or a technical case. Um, there's a network piece, there's an application piece. I mean, to, to, I say, I don't say dumb it down, but really zero trust is, this is how we know Chuck is who Chuck is and Chuck's allowed into this network and it can talk to this application. The application re-verifies that this is me talking to the application to make sure that we're secure. Are there ways around it? Of course. Uh, yes. So um, unfortunately, if you even look at Microsoft um, with the latest things with the, with the different types of attacks, um, there's, there's ways around everything. So Zero Trust, what it does is it will, there's more checkpoints along the way so we can find enough, so we can find the anomalies along the way. If I can add to that, sure. uh, I do have a, a, a real life example where we try to implement zero trust at a at a uh, healthcare company, and and it wasn't necessarily the technology that stopped the deployment of the seg of of zero trust. It was, and and I say this all the time to all my students and to all my clients that. You know, we talk about the technology and the technology always works well. It's a ones and zeros and it and technology does what it's supposed to do. Where it gets murky is the people and process side and in particular the people, right? Um, because now you have turf battles as Chuck alluded to, who owns zero trust? Uh, is it the networking? Is it the application? Is it the, you know, uh, virtual teams? And, and then you have these political turf battles that prevent it from happening. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's difficult when you have multiple stakeholders, when you have to, within an enterprise, within an organization, when you have to get multiple stakeholders across uh, functions involved, uh, it, it, that therein is the secret sauce, right? If you can make that happen, then you can make things happen within an organization, but uh, you're going to be fought all along the way. And I, have to, I, have to, I have to agree, as an MSP, that is a secret sauce, Mark. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's people, right? You got to have buy-in from all, all around, because zero trust is a very complicated thing to implement. Once done, it's great, but it's getting to that point. Right. 
Yeah, what is the strategy there, right? So we can talk about all of these technology advancements, but it comes down to just buy-in, change management. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have a strategy for that? How do you convince people? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of organizations, and I'm, I'm sorry for hogging it up, but but I, I have a lot of um, scars and battle wounds <laughs> from these fights. And typically, uh, it, it, it requires... 100% uh, buy-in from the top, right? If you don't have your highest level um, uh, 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 executives, and in, 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 in this case, it'd be the CIO or the CISO, uh, if you don't have them bought into it, and if they're not helping you make it happen, then more than likely it will not happen. So uh, that has been my experience. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say I think it's I think it's the buy-in. I think it's also the culture, right? So you have to really look at the company. Like, can this company do this, right? And be very upfront with the you know the, the CEO, CIO, because it is a trans. It transforms the way the company operates if you if done correctly. So there's going to be a lot of resistance, um, most likely, right? So again, can the culture handle it? And a lot of zero trust implementations do take a long time, just because it's so many different changes. Um, it, that inside the operating environment, it does take a while to roll out. So you just can't tune on all at once or you're going to have a mutiny on your hands. So you got to just roll it in. But again, you have to have that buy-in because what's going to happen is, you know, the CEO, the CIO is going to go for it. And if the CEO doesn't fully understand that CIO or CTO is going to be in for a rough road. So. Yeah. Stefan, how do you sell to get buy-in? Yeah, so I've seen it from two sides, which is kind of interesting. I've seen like startups be like, we want everything to be zero trust, which is awesome. We love to see. And we've also worked with, you know, large um, banks that are trying to modernize their system. So I guess first with the startups, we see that that one's a much easier sell, right? Like they have, you know, a smaller level of infrastructure and a higher level of flexibility with new technology. So the buy-ins, there's a lot less like levels to go through for the buy-in, um, but you know, we're seeing a pretty good proliferation with zero trust because it's, you know, it's the, kind of the right thing to do when you're starting now. And now with the big, you know, financial organization, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing like multi-year uh, engagements with them just to set up zero trust. And a, a lot of that is from this pain factor uh, with this company, <laughs> you know, all their contractors have to get a laptop and do like two weeks of security training. Like any new person who, who needs to do any amount of work, no matter how little it is, and it's so painful. So I think, you know, that pain is helping us push the message with these companies, like, you need a better solution. So we've been, you know, working with them for quite some time. And we have, we have buy-in from the executives, but each team, you know, needs, you know, like, you have to build, you have to, it's kind of like a fire, you have to get that spark, like a single champion at the company that sees, you know, the vision and the potential. And then that their team has to adopt zero trust, and then that is to spread. And then, of course, some some teams use in technology that doesn't work, and then you have to kind of get creative. So it's a really bumpy road, but like the, I think the selling the um, kind of the outcome is really how you do it, and the outcome is awesome because uh, zero trust is more secure and it's better for the end user because end users come first. Yeah, it's a big question of risk, right? Uh, so, Anne Marie, I wanted to ask you when you're talking with your clients. How do they weigh the cost of, let's say, your services against the potential cost of an attack, right? Because there has to be, how do you quantify that risk or what do you tell them? So typically, we actually give them stats on how much a cyber attack will cost. And we have real stats from clients that have come to us because they've been involved in a cyber attack. So typically, we just we just give them and tell them what we've experienced give them the facts, and then we weigh out the costs. And sometimes costs obviously is a concern, especially now. And so sometimes we we have to figure out priority where they may not be able to get everything. So we give them a roadmap of what they should do now, absolutely what they should do now and what they should plan to do in the future. Got it. All right. So you're holding their hands. You're walking them through it. I you're consulting really. Yeah. A hundred, a hundred percent. And it's interesting because with, you also have to consult with the different players 
the, the different decision makers within a company, right? Because typically the CIOs, the tech people, they're all for it, but then they have to, they have to convince maybe their board, they have to convince the CFO. So that's the challenging part. It's getting everybody on, on board to, to have them agree on the solution. Right. There's that hippo acronym, right? Highest paid person's opinion or in the office, something like that, right? You got to sway them. Uh, so good. Yeah. So we have zero trust where, I mean, there was that principle, never trust, always verify. It can be a headache though. It could be a pain. At LMU, we use Duo for MFA and students. I hear they complain about it. It's that extra friction. Uh, so we hear it, uh, but yeah, there is that cost, right? And there's, you could see, well, there's real penalties or losses that we can incur. Uh, so I actually just wanted to point to what Hugo post, uh, mentioned in the Q&A. So don't forget to post your questions. Um, so that way we can address them later. So we have these models or people are lots of vendors, right? And trying to hold these vendors accountable, but maybe we're just okay. buying licenses, subscribing, but there can be this yeah. risk of overconfidence, right? So where can, where can this be a problem? Or can you provide examples where we're over-reliant on vendor promises or maybe automation or AI? Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, you can look at the latest CrowdStrike incident, right? I mean, that was that's a good example of, um, that you trust your vendor that they're going to do everything correct, right? Um, but again, they're still a very good company. A lot of people still trust them. Um, the thing with vendors, and this actually goes to another uh, part of the same conversation is trust but verify, kind of like zero trust, right? So like as Mark and Stephen work with different vendors, right? So you want to make sure that your vendors are actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. So I actually have a, a quick story about this. So of course, I'm in the cybersecurity space and we're always investigating new technologies, right? We, you know, this, that's what we do. We're always looking for that edge, you know, so we can be the attackers. So I heard about this new product, right? And they already had like literally 50,000 agents deployed, you know, across the country. They're doing awesome. I'm like, oh, this, is a, this could be a real game changer. So I go through my questionnaire with them. I'm like, okay, we're interviewing them, right? So, all right. So what are you doing for security? Because you are a cybersecurity vendor. Oh, we're on Amazon Cloud. Okay. Um, okay. So what are you doing for logs? You're looking at your logs. Uh, Amazon does that. I'm like, that's not the right answer. <laughs> all right. All right. So what are you doing for your SOC? Do you have someone on your team? Do you have a SOC internally? No. Do you use a third party to, to be your security operations? No. I'm like, okay. So you have no visibility. You have no, none of these other things happening. Um, so you're deployed across 50,000 customer, 50,000 your customer base. So if something happens to your environment, you wouldn't know and you would compromise 50,000 endpoints. And they're like, uh, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so again, um, it's, it's this, so I think it's one of the most critical things is picking your vendors and asking the hard questions. No matter who you think they are, ask the same, ask them. Do they have a SOC 2 report? What is this? What is that? Do you have a security questionnaire? Um, I'm sorry, guys, I'm just gonna take it for one more second. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is cyber security insurance is gonna be harder and harder to come by. Companies are stop, stop, we've heard of stories or the, the threat is they're gonna stop offering it because they paid out so much in ransomwares and breaches um, that it's gonna be harder to get cyber insurance. So knowing what vendors you're working with, because your customer is going to ask you too, what are you doing? So that's just um, something to think about. I don't have too many trust uh, um, questions. I mean, an uh, answers because um, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I don't trust a lot of people, a lot of organ, a lot of companies. <laughs> so I always verify. Right. <laughs> Stefan, you have anything? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, you know, with AI, I think we're still still early enough where we're not like in, uh, trusting, you know, our entire organizational security to AI. I would say automation has existed for a while, so kind of automated steps where this mm -hmm. happens, and um, you know, uh, some configurations automatically change. I've definitely seen uh, situations where that has led to vulnerabilities. So. I've seen it with customers. It's always like, it's always the firewalls. There's always some automation where if, if you know, risk A happens, 
Um, the response is to close your firewall or modify it or in some way, shape, or form. So I've definitely seen situations where you know people are locked out of a you know a server, and oftentimes that's because of automation. Now, since it's not like since a human made the logic, it is undoable, and it is um, you know it can be tuned and improved in the future. But definitely once that's done, once the logic and decision making are fully automated by AI, that's when it gets a little bit uh, that's when it gets a little bit spooky. So you know when that day comes, you just have to be a little bit aware what can be automatically uh you kind of have to keep inventory of what can automatically be uh you know reconfigured and what can't be and i would and you know i know lots of organizations want to automate everything you have to be very careful and deliberate about what you do automate uh because you know it could what you think could be helping you could actually be adding additional risk yeah, what are the other risks to automation? Because sometimes automation is thought of as low-hanging fruit. Okay, we'll just automate. We could huge cost savings here, but how can we be a little bit more cautious to mitigate issues where automation goes haywire or does too much? Yeah, uh, no. Chuck, if you have something, I'll go after you. Yeah, no, um, the automations are great. Um, but again, it's maintaining all those automations, all those playbooks and, oh man, like, let's say the fire, like, uh, someone was saying, you know, the firewall firmware updates now breaks that automation. And then, you know, you have all these broken automations. So automations are great, but they're a lot of work. Um, so it, <laughs> I, I love automation. However, in this space, because you have so many different tools from so many different vendors, it, it's a lot of upkeep. And so the risk is the automation is breaking and you might not know, even though you could have safeguards in place and guardrails, you just don't know. So again, there's a lot of work, um, even with all the automations. Um, that answers the question, but. Uh, so yeah, fair yeah. warning. Definitely good. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and so in a past life, one of the CISOs I worked with was very deliberate. One of his four principles was like, no, uh, a breach should only happen if two thing two things have to break for us to be breached. So having a second level of security, I think in security is like yeah. uh, you know a set of walls. Having two different walls in place for everything that helps a lot, right? Um, so don't be over reliant on your automations. Definitely make sure that even though your analysts, since they're freed up from their work, they're doing other things. They're still keeping an eye on what they built. Um, so definitely making sure nothing is is just ignored no matter how much prior work has been done to secure it um, and then building that second layer of security into everything so oftentimes we'll see like a um, you know a detective control you know detect if something's wrong and also a set of preventative controls like in google cloud and other cloud platforms there's usually a way to prevent things from happening so you mechanically prevent api calls from happening that's a nice reassurance that something won't break, but um, you know, typically that's kind of the second layer of defense. So it can be a lot of work, can be not exactly a, a solve all, but um, it, it kind of goes I, back. Well, go ahead, just Mark. One, one other quick thing is um, uh, you have to, just like you manage change in your organization and, and a, a patch update, you have to also manage your automation, right? And making sure you know what's being automated and when it's being automated so that if anything happens, uh, you have uh, a log or a record of it and you can uh, you can check that for any potential issue that it, it has caused. We need to do some version control. Yeah, just visibility into all these logs and what it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so to manage all this, uh, we have just many security priorities. It's probably a never ending list. Uh, so how do you negotiate that with business goals and day-to-day -day operations? Because I want to go keep going back to that. We know cybersecurity is a good thing, but how do we balance that with business goals and day-to-day -day operations? <clears throat> yeah, well, you, you have to prioritize your business risk. Right. I mean, uh, that that's the bottom line. That's the beginning of it all. You list your your business risks and and the impact that a security event would happen or would it would have if that business risk was um, was impacted. 
and then uh, and then you prioritize where you're going to get the most bang for your buck when you put your security controls in place and your security technologies in place to to meet those uh, to reduce those business risks. So it all starts with uh, with having a, a deep understanding of your business, your risk, the risk to your business. So Anne Marie you mentioned priority when you're talking to those clients, but what dictates that priority? I'm going to bring up an example for us internally, right? So be, so we have um, an MSP and we have a SOC. And obviously for us compared to other companies, cybersecurity is our highest priority because we are also responsible for protecting clients, right? But you bring a, up a good point in terms of how do you make it a priority? So our company, we do, I don't know if, you, if your students have heard of EOS or an L10. So we have these meetings, we have weekly meetings and we have quarterly meetings. And we actually just met with the leadership team where we had a full day meeting and it was our, our quarterly meeting and we met for a full day and we talked about what are our priorities to finish off Q4 really strong. And so out of everything that we, we looked at in our company, we're right now currently going for our, our SOC 2. And we think that that's the most important thing for us to do. And that takes a lot of time because we've been working on it for a full year. And we are about 50% there. And, and knowing that that's the most important thing for our company, we've dedicated the whole quarter for uh, across multiple departments. And we said, we are dropping many different things in terms of priorities. And we are saying this is the most important thing. So we are taking things off people's plate to make sure that they have enough dedicated time to make that a priority. Because there's always fires to put out, right? But you have Absolutely. to take a step back and, okay, let's make this a priority. Absolutely. Especially in terms of projects, right? So we, every, normally companies have priorities in ter terms of projects. So we said, this is going to be our company project. And so we are, so we're moving certain things from Q4 and, and putting it to Q1. So you're meeting quarterly. Uh, so many enterprises and organizations because they get so big, they have this inertia, right? To, they kind of move slowly. Whereas we're competing against hackers where they're automating things, right? So Chuck, like you said, you post a vulnerability, they're just pick that up and try to exploit it. Uh, so what can organizations do to overcome this inertia? Is it just having these regular meetings and checkpoints? What do we do? I can jump in here. I'm a, So we started doing this from maybe the first or second year we started business. So we've been in business for 10 years and this is something that we've implemented from day one when we, we when we were a company of two and three people. And so, yes, I would say that. It, and it's how you set your meetings because it's not just complaining about different things. It's okay, what are the complaints? What are the issues? What are we gonna do about it? And then you meet every week to make sure, are we getting done all the things we said that were important? Are we getting those done? So yeah, I would say, meeting quarterly, meeting weekly, and meeting across departments, and um, just making sure that the, that communication and those priorities are being checked on and, and being, um, what do you call it, determined every quarter, and then checking on them every week. And for some of the bigger corporate clients that I work with, they feel that the silver bullet is working in an agile, uh, um, you know, agile methodology, agile um, way of getting things done. And, um, and it could work and it does work if you have people that are in the organization that understand the ag agile met methodology, but, um, you know, it, it still doesn't, um, it, it's not a, um, uh, it, it's not a solve all for that inertia that you're speaking about. Right. I was going to say, um, from a technical standpoint with the inertia, what you're talking about, is we, we carry a risk register for every client. So meaning, you know, we know where they're at from a cybersecurity standpoint, and it not, might not be just cybersecurity, it could be business risk as well. So we actually have a risk register to make sure that whatever we can do and what's the highest priority for the client and move that ball forward or down the field. But again, it's also culture. I keep going back to culture. So if, if the client wants to move fast, you know, and they have the, the right culture inside the organization to move fast, but if they have the Titanic, which we've worked with, it's slow to turn, and then they're never going to get out of their own way. So I just wanted to put that out there. Culture is super important to, to making the things move. So, Stefan, what kind of clients do you work with? How do you have these regular check-ins with them? Because I'm seeing you probably have a variety of clients. Yeah, how do you schedule these kinds of check-ins to make sure goals I are being... 
Yeah. So it really depends on the kind of how we're engaged with the client. Uh, you know, a lot of our work is, you know, six to eight week long engagements where we implement a tool. So that'll be like, you know, weekly check-ins. Um, we usually project managers are there to kind of see, see where they're at with their, you know, implementing something um, with, you know, our MSSP solution that would be kind of a, a monthly check-in where that we'd give them a detailed report of like how they're trending really. Um, so, you know, once we're starting to detect the risks and establish a baseline, how they're trending in terms of increased risk, or maybe they've increased their kind of attack surface by adding new tools or new servers or new software. So, you know, helping them see the Delta and their risk um, and making sure that, you know, they're regularly updated. One thing we do a lot of is, you know, with all of our customers, we'll open up a chat channel. So having that direct line of communication is something that we've seen a lot of. Uh, it seems to be very successful and helps build, you know, build increased trust because it's super easy to, you know, contact someone, um, no matter how high up they are, just through a chat message because, uh, you know, the, the lines of communication should be as easy as possible. So good. I just wanted to give a heads up. We're going to go into the audience Q&A after this last top topic. So just make sure you get your questions ready or you can submit them now into the Q&A. OK. All right. So for our last topic and many a topic that I'm sure students are interested in or early in career professionals are interested in, it's just cybersecurity career advice. Right. So we've heard that there's obviously lots of work. It seems so thank you for being here to the panel. Seems like there's a lot on your plate. There's lots of upkeep for automations, meetings to run, projects to manage, people to talk with. And while staying on top of all the different uh, threats and trends that are happening in the space. So with that said, what are the emerging roles or skills that are critical in cybersecurity now? So if you had to go back to school and wish you could pick a subject, what would you learn now? He wants to go first, I guess. I expect I guess an I'll answer from all of you. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, the simple answer is AI, right? You you have yeah. to be at the forefront of AI. And, you know, my, my son's a freshman uh, in college now, and, and he, he's a business major, but it, I make him, made him, uh, twisted his arm and told him, you need to get a minor in AI, right? Because if you're going to be in business, you need to have that technology background. He was he was torn between cybersecurity or an MI AI, and um, of course because I'm in cybersecurity, he chose the other uh, the other technology. So uh, so I would say you know you have to really be at, understand AI. And I've gone uh, I'm I'm in the process of going back to school and and continuing to learn AI. I just actually finished the uh, A AI the Azure uh, AI course. And, um, and and I have you know one, I'm at the cusp uh, of, uh, I, I applied for a grant uh, through the Learning Lab, which is a California-based uh, organization to train faculty, $1.5 million to train faculty on the use of AI or integrating AI within their curriculum. So, um, and, and that will then roll down, of course, to the students. So you, uh, with, with, the, with everything that's going on with AI, you have to, um, understand uh, how it's going to be used. We're still figuring that out, right? We don't, nobody knows with certainty how AI is going to impact us in the next, you know, two years from now. Uh, but uh, you have to grow incrementally uh, as the technology, as the use of the technology grows incrementally. Sounds good. Um, I would actually, there's three I would, I would do. Um, I would say AI to go with Mark for sure because uh, it's it is going to change everything. It already it's already starting to. Uh, two would be soft skills. I I think I interview a lot of people and you know we actually say we will take um, people that have the right attitude and drive over tech or over their technical skills. Technical technical skills can be taught, but the attitude and drive cannot. Mm -hmm. So and again, if you're not a good speaker or are afraid to speak, go do Toastmasters, go do something else. You really have to work on that because you will get that entry level job, but communication skills and soft skills is what's going to elevate you in your career path. And then Absolutely. third, finance. You got to learn how to, you know, you got to learn how to manage money. <laughs> so. 
the good, mm-hmm. good trifecta there. Yeah. Yeah, good life tip there as well. Um, I would say, you know, I, you know, I, I, well, I agree with you, Chuck. I would actually take another angle on this and say, if you know something super well, like the confidence will naturally come out of that. So I would, what I would personally do, if I were to go back in time, um, well, I, so I did take Greg's uh, database course back at LMU, which was awesome. And that taught me a lot about kind of data management uh, for business, right? So how data is manipulated and exposed for business applications. And that was a great course, although we had to learn SQL and I don't really want to use SQL ever again, but uh, <laughs> no offense to SQL, but there's other things out there. Um, I wish I took that a step further because now I'm seeing so much of that kind of data manipulation um, happening at all levels of the organization for all sorts of applications that I I think there's a lot of different additional paths that could have opened up to me if I knew, like felt like I was a whiz with data. So I think getting really, really good at data will help you get the confidence you need to what, what so when you talk to a company because you want to join them, you'll have, you know, you'll be able to talk from a position of confidence and, you know, reassurance and calmness because you know something so well, you just need to spread the word. So I really think, you know, learning those data foundations is mission critical um, to succeeding with security in the future. And uh, I'll add one other thing because I tell my students this all the time and especially, you know, for college students that, that are just coming out of college and they have very little experience, you, you uh, whatever field or whatever um, uh, uh, specialization within the field that you want to uh, be in, you need to get an industry certification. Indus- industry certifications gives the uh, the employer an understanding of your base of what your knowledge is, so that they can then uh, assess where you are and how the, you fit within the organization. So I uh, I I'm a firm believer in industry certifications and. I've throughout my career, I've taken uh, and and become certified in all the different certifications you can think of, uh, because I want people to know what I uh, that uh, the areas of expertise that I know, or the know to know that I know what what I'm talking to them about. So for me, um, I actually don't think I would do it that much differently. So I went, um, I have a double major. My family really wanted me to get into computers. So I have a comp sci degree with a a bachelor of mathematics and I have a double major with business. So it has had both of my loves in there. The only regret I think I have is back in the day, and this is 20 plus years ago when I was in school, they actually had AI, AI classes and AI paths. And I thought, you know, what, what do you need that for? (laughs) And here we are, um, 20 years later, but I real after college, what I really got into was, um, Stephanie, you mentioned data analytics. So I was a data scientist. Um, I, you know, I worked with big data databases, and I think that that was really helpful in my career. And especially when it comes to business, because I can spot trends, I can analyze business data. And that's basically how I got into, cyber is because I was just looking at the data with my own business and I was looking at the trends and I started seeing trends towards cybersecurity. And I realized I, we got to pivot and get more into cybersecurity in order to stay ahead of the curve. So Emery, with your background, so let's say somebody is knowledgeable in technology, but maybe lacks these kinds of hands-on hard skills. Uh, if you were to go to a job search engine, what would you type in there for your skill set? So we want, we want to cater towards people who may want to work on the business side and work with data, but not necessarily be managing firewalls or pushing out updates or working on infrastructure. Yeah, what kind of roles should somebody look for? So do you mean look for in terms of what am I looking for as an employer or what, oh. are, what should a student be? What should a student be looking for? So they're sitting between business and tech. Uh, maybe like what Chuck says, they have good soft skills. Uh, but maybe they don't have a CS with a math degree, uh, but they have a business degree. Got it. And they want, and so is a question where, what should they be looking for in terms of skills? Role, t- t- uh, skills and titles, maybe titles. Let's start with titles because there can be so many and so cryptic, but is there, because they can't look for CXO, right? Got it. You know, 
I would say um, analyst. So I started in consulting right after college. I got a couple offers and I, I worked for I worked for Accenture, right, which is a consulting company. And when I started, not everybody had a tech background. I mean, some people had an arts background. They had healthcare background. And when you join a big consulting company like that, they put you through rigorous training. So it was really interesting because I had a tech background. I learned to code in school, but they took people that never saw code before and they put them through training where they understood high level how to code, but they at least taught them how to consult. And so I would say, look up anal analyst type roles. Okay. Business analyst. Yeah. Business analyst would be definitely uh, one of those roles to look for. Perfect. I wasn't fishing for anything because that is part of our major. Uh, but yes, yes. Business analysts, being able to consult, really, to understand requirements, yeah. asking good questions. Yeah, I second that. I think anyone that came from a big four like myself does have an advantage because they know the social and the technical components uh, really, really well from the beginning of their career. They just train you super well. So that's definitely a good one, um, I think. And then people that know data, people that know data and troubleshooting. So I don't know how you would search for troubleshooting abilities. You'd probably have to go through like, I don't know, another key, keyword there, but people that can troubleshoot are super, super valuable. Um, it's It sounds like a skill like everyone has, but it's it's kind of this like innate curiosity to go deeper at all times. That from what I've seen, you know, hiring people um, is, you know, the best skill, one of the best skills you can have early in your career. And then from a business perspective, uh, certainly a project coordinator, project manager, uh, you want to have that uh, kind of, you want to look for that type of job at a, at a fresh out of college, probably a project coordinator, but working towards becoming a project manager. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. This is a, a good discussion. I want to make sure we address the questions in the audience Q&A. And so... Let's see, to the panelists, can you see the questions? Yes. All right, so we'll just take them from the top here. Uh, so from Kim, she asks, what is the most, uh, I guess what is the most important cybersecurity issue that companies have to face? Is that your question? I think she meant common. Common, yes. Yeah, what is the most common? Well, nowadays it's ransomware, right? Everybody is looking to protect themselves against ransomware attacks. Um, so uh, from my perspective and some of the bigger clients that I've worked for and work with, uh, that's one of their biggest concerns. Yep. I was gonna say hygiene, which goes with ransomware, right? So it's so one of the latest incident responses we did, uh, we were called in, they had old VMware, which is a virtualization platform and they also had outdated, outdated firewalls that had vulnerabilities, right? So you just pick a place where the attacker could get in. But if you have good hygiene, it, it helps mitigate the risks. So hygiene for us, I think, and for a lot of companies out there, it's a very hard thing to do because there's so, there's so many different things you got to update your, your laptops, your firewalls, your switches, this, that, and the other. And then also trying to mitigate and keep your attack surface as small as possible, right? So I say hygiene. Uh, would be my answer for that one. So, but it's it's a it's a lot that goes to that. Okay. All right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know with a lot of bigger companies, even maybe government agencies. Yeah, you have this legacy hardware, still have to update and refresh. Yeah, lots of opportunities. Yeah, okay. I would say I see a lot of compliance questions. Uh, you know, even moving away from compliance, trying to focus on cyber compliance, still the driver for lots of things. So. Very common question is, how do I get compliant in this area? Um, so yeah. we see that one pop up a lot. That's right. Yeah, government agencies, financially, companies with financial interests. Yes, trying to get compliant. That's a big one. All right. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, do you see any national or regional differences in utilizing AI for cybersecurity? So I guess between, yes, be, does it change geographically? And how would you customize your services for different clients? Personally, I don't see a change by re region or, or nationally. In fact, uh, the more environments I go into, the more they seem the same. 
Um, I see it, there's a lot of commonality amongst uh, organizations, enterprises, and uh, you know that's why I can work in just about any uh, any type of industry because at, at bottom line is they very, they all look very similar. Yep, I was going to say for for that one. So I think it it, it comes down to the I think I and I've said culture many times during this webinar, but some companies have adopted a. Uh, AI, you know, we are going to adopt AI for cybersecurity. We're going to adopt AI for this for internally. And some companies are like, no way at all. So, um, but I don't think it's regional. I think it's just, you know, per corporation and the management and how they feel. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we see. Yeah. I want to, I want to add to that too, in terms of not just AI, but just cybersecurity as a whole and not and not just nationally, but outside of the US. I do feel that the US is one of the leading countries for cybersecurity. Just having visited many countries in the last couple of years, I'm just noticing that there are certain countries that are really, really behind in cybersecurity. And I think it's just a matter of time that you'll see more attacks in those countries. And I think there's, I actually think there's gonna be more opportunity in those countries just because they're not ahead of the curve. So what do you recommend we do with that information? Do we try to find jobs out there or what's your I, guidance? I definitely think that there will be opportunity in those in those countries. So starting, you could start a company, you could, uh, yeah, definitely start a company in certain countries. That's definitely what we're looking at. <laughs> How about other states? You have Hawaii. Won't take that from you. Correct. Well, our our MSP is locally in Hawaii, but our cybersecurity, our, our SOC is nationwide. But we're also looking at bringing SOCs in other countries as well, because other countries, they don't have that. Cybersecurity is not their focus in certain countries, which is very scary. Very, very scary. But how do you manage it? So this to everyone where let's say you have a parent company, they're based in the US, but they have branches internationally. And then there's probably different rules and regulations. We're going through that right now. So it what that looks like is having lawyers in other countries and having those discussions. So knowing what the laws are in all of those regions and making sure that you have legal representation, knowledgeable people in those different areas to guide you. So we're planning on opening in, in several countries at the moment. So um, just speaking with those different lawyers and having and just understanding those laws, it's it's definitely a lot of a lot of work and research. So it sounds like another learning opportunity to learn about the law, but related to cyber and data. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Next question from Tommy is. How do you think quantum computing could change cybersecurity with its threat to encryption? And do you see people currently preparing for this? So that's uh, a good question. Uh, yeah, uh, let me go real quick here, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I think, I think that, that's definitely a fear a lot of people have. You know, we're definitely you know, seeing a renewed push for quantum computing. And then one of its most obvious uh, implications or one of its most clear implications is that it, will, it might break a lot of encryption ciphers. I think really it's going to cause us to change the way we think about, you know, security. We're going to, it's going to require more than just encryption to actually fully secure something. Uh, it's going to require, you know, zero trust monitoring. It's going to emphasize uh, security across the entire stack. Um, so I think, I think it'll have a lot of, you know, effects, but I, I think we're still also extremely early with quantum computing. I think that's still pretty far out, but in advance of that, I'd really, you know, we always tell our clients to use modern encryption ciphers. Um, those are constantly evolving too. It's not just the attackers that are evolving, the defense, or not just the threats that evolve, the defenses evolve. And then also think of security holistically um, because encryption might not be, you know, might not be as uh, strong as it once was. Yeah, the second thing, yeah, we are seeing, you know, there is a risk. Uh, you know, there's a lot of corporations out there that have their own PKI or private key infrastructure, right? So that is a risk. Uh, I think it's a little bit far down the road, but could a nation state take advantage of that with their own quantum? Possibly. Um, but we are seeing marketing already saying quantum proof cryptography and quantum proof this. So I'm already starting to see that in the market. So it's coming. Mm -hmm. Right. 
A question from Professor Ken Summers, who also teaches cybersecurity. So we've somewhat touched on this already. He asked, what advice would you give students interested in cybersecurity? Where do you see the best new job opportunities? Maybe you could speak to certain industries or business units. I can jump here. Uh, I actually have a daughter that just graduated from high school. And so Chuck and I, we are completely encouraging her to get into cybersecurity. And so, um, so some of the things that we're telling her to do is to understand Linux, understand uh, Python, and Chuck, you can jump in here. But another thing I was telling her, because, you know, she she doesn't love the tech part of it. And I said, if you understand cybersecurity, you're always going to have a job. But we also, she took a gap, she's taking a gap year right now. And so we're also getting her involved in everything cybersecurity related. So even the marketing, even the sales. So we're even teaching her, you know, how to pick up the phone and do some preliminary sales calls. So just having her have a wide range of knowledge, then she can pick and choose what type of job she can have within cybersecurity. Yeah, because it could be cybersecurity sales. It could be, there's a lot of different pieces just in the whole industry. So a lot of, a lot of different opportunities there, not just in the tech. Um, so yeah, there's, there's tons and tons of opportunities. I would say definitely if you're going to be on the tech side, more around the data and understanding data. Right. I think that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, the day, I mean, there, there are the day of the AI analyst is coming, but it's not going to solve it. The AI analyst, uh, even what we've seen preliminary, I've seen other startups that have the AI analyst. And at the end of the day, it's not going to, it's going to change the way we do things, but it's not going to replace to 100%. If that makes any sense. So yeah. her gap is yep, not I education. Yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I fully agree with what's been said before. Uh, I think there's a lot of areas of cyber, not just being like a stock analyst, you know, consultants, there's, there's always going to be cyber consultants. Personally, I see a lot more companies looking to outsource cybersecurity because they don't want to deal with it. They want to focus on what they do best. So I definitely see that as like kind of a mega trend, um, out, more like outsourcing. But also, you know, yeah, so many of, uh, I've seen so many salespeople from all walks of life in my past move to like cyber because it's just such a hot area. There's the largest amount of vendor proliferation I've ever seen. So there's tons of opportunities to, you know, do sales or do marketing with cybersecurity. It's a whole, and it's a huge in industry. And I went to RSA uh, this year, which is like the big cybersecurity conference in San Francisco. And it was it was crazy. I mean, there was so many vendors. They all said they do security and AI. Like I kind of least a couple dozen that said that, but the fact there's so many companies means that there's a lot of opportunity out there and you don't have to just be a sock, like what people picture cybersecurity is like a sock analyst to be involved in the industry. I'm seeing from my students, sales engineers, a growing role so, you know, related to product perhaps. Yeah, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a SOC analyst only. Yeah, sales engineering is awesome. That's a fun place. So. Okay, next question from Caroline. Let's see. So are you concerned about the rapid development of AI outpacing the establishment of necessary regulations, compliance, and ethical safeguards? So how do you think this might impact businesses? Um, I'll, I can start with that one. So. Uh, so rapid. So yeah, again, it comes down to AI is gonna is gonna totally it's totally outpacing already, and again, it's gonna come down to the corporate compliance side of the firm. Like, you know, the bigger firms are already putting in. You know, again, respond. We, we there's a big buzzword called responsible AI, right? So what is you know put the guardrails in the business? It, are we gonna do AI? Is it gonna be wide open? Is it gonna be small? Are we only gonna do this and then? It's going to be up to IT and corporate uh, compliance to say, we're only going to allow this much AI. We're only going to go this far. Some companies might say, well, we're going to push it th th this far. Some companies might do it all the way. So again, it all is going to come down to really the type of firm that you're working with. So Right. And, and I agree 100% with Chuck just said, and I probably would have said something similar, not as well as he did. Um, but yes, the, 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 the AI is already outpacing us and... Yeah, the, the company and the corporation is going to determine how slow or how fast they're going to implement and use AI. Okay, good. Uh, this question from Grant, 
So Mark, you mentioned about certifications. So he's asking how or what certifications are available to show strength in tech AI fields related to business analytics and information technology or even cybersecurity? Yeah. Well, I uh, certainly at a very at the at the entry level, it's the Security Plus certification, um, and then any of the AI cloud uh, certifications. If you wanted to uh, get into AI, Microsoft and AWS and Google has have their entry level. So any entry level clouds or a or cybersecurity certification will certainly uh, uh, help you get the necessary knowledge that you need to to find that first role that you're, that you're looking for. But from anybody else. And I'll, I'll say this, and that's, that's a, a life, a career long event. I just yeah. finished, uh, you know, t uh, this year, probably three, four months ago, I got the CCSP, the uh, uh, cloud security practitioner. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have the CISSP and CISM and all of those, uh, oh, but, right now I have to do, you know, now I have to do these others, the AIs, um, and, and, and it's a, it's a career long thing. If you want to stay relevant, you have to uh, show others that, you know, uh, what you know, and the certification is one way to do that. Oh, Mark, you said it very, very well. I mean, I was going to say the only thing I uh, have to reiterate, so I just want to reiterate the point is if you're in cyber or IT or anything related, it's a career of learning, you yeah. know, I have a CNA. For, I, you guys have probably never even heard of Novell. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that. You know, it was hot back in 1995. But, 95, yes. <laughs> so, but nobody would need it anymore, right? So you always mm -hmm. got to stay up to date with what's the latest and greatest, especially if you're going to stay ahead. Now, uh, you know, the other option is you become a dinosaur. You don't want to be there either. So, right, right. That's the fun part about this field. And there's always that shiny object syndrome, too. So always trying to test out new things and learn new things. Okay. Yeah, it's I think it keeps it fun though. I think it keeps it fresh that there's always changes. I think AI did definitely affect, like security was one of the first areas it was applied to, at least in the Google ecosystem. So, um, you know, it's really cool to be at the forefront of that. But yeah, I do think all the clouds, you know, cloud provider certifications are good. I think Greg, you, you, you know, train your students on, how to pass one, or is it like the AWS practitioner or there's some sort of guidance you gave around that, but that's a really good start. I think knowing the specific tools is really valuable too, because there's a set of core tools in that proliferate around this, you know, across the cybersecurity environment um, that can kind of elevate you over other candidates. So that's really good. And then, um, you know, I think learning, yeah, learning the languages, learning the languages like Linux, learning Python, um, learning Kubernetes, all that does help people separate themselves from the pack. Yeah, that is good to hear. Linux, command line, Python. And I even like what you said, Stefan, about troubleshooting. I mean, that is a skill, but it's not often taught. You just learn by fire, right? And then you start developing these mental models on how to troubleshoot. But right. we're constantly fixing things. It's not always building things from scratch. We inherit something and then we have to troubleshoot and fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. In the context of cloud-based security, what are some best practices that organizations can adopt to secure their data and applications in multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environments? Well, well uh, ahead, Mark. Uh, let me say easily. Uh, easily uh, number one is you know encryption, encryption, uh, encrypting data at rest and data in motion. Uh, that's rudimentary to anything cloud. So. Yeah, I was going to say it all depends on the organization and how big the organization is. So if you're a 20 person organization, I wouldn't really recommend hybrid because you wouldn't have the manpower, secure a local like model it at your office or in a data center and the cloud if you only have 20 people. Um, but if you have, you know, a hundred, you know, it all depends on the size of your organization. If you can do hybrid cloud, you know, or even multi-cloud, right? So it all depends on, also depends on what business you're into. So there's a lot of different factors there. Um, again, if you have the right resources to secure everything, it's whatever, you, I'd say, let me rewind, whatever you have the, with the amount of resources that you have, what can you secure the easiest? And that should probably be the route you should go. Um, 
So again, you got and you, and again, if you don't know, I would all bring in a third party to audit to know what if you're if you think you know what you know and then what you're doing. So. Yep, and I think one you know one mega trend we saw over the last couple of years with cloud was uh, a suite of tools previously called cloud security posture management, um, which kind of was kind of like you know detecting and preventing uh, configurations. So detecting malicious con or bad configurations or misconfigurations in your environment, and then then um, you know protecting against potential misconfigurations, allowing security teams to set the exact baseline for how they want their environment to look like. That was a big mega trend. And then that kind of evolved last year and this year into a new uh, a new uh, acronym called uh, C, wait, what's it? Oh, CNAP, Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. So that's the evolution of CSPM. And that does that takes the, the cloud security posture that was previously covered, but also bolts on like identity posture, right? So making sure that users have the appropriate level of permissions and the least permission possible. And also like any applications running in their environment, um, performing vulnerability scans and looking at security baselines on maybe like on the platform level, um, that is kind of proliferated into a suite of tools uh, that I, you know, that's very pervasive. There's every single vendor is trying to create a, their own CNAP. This has been kind of a thing like Google just announced one a few months ago. CrowdStrike has one, uh, Microsoft has one, like every major like like company that's in the cloud is trying to develop their own uh, multi-cloud security solution because it's such a common solution to these problems. So more than anything else in cyber, I would say cloud security is uh, oftentimes does come down to the tools you have because those tools give you actionable data um, so one and one just to add on one that became like really big. You guys might have seen the headlines. It's called Wiz. Um, it was the first fastest company ever to reach ten billion dollars in valuation of like any company ever, and that was a cloud security posture management tool. So just you know to put that out there, like this is a super hot area that uh, you know we're seeing almost every company adopt by this point by twenty twenty four into next year. So there was a question about entrepreneurship. So uh, I know Anne Marie. I saw there was this interview. You wanted to start your own business, right? So now, how can we adopt this entrepreneurial mindset where there's all these product offerings coming out within cyber? But how, yeah, what? How do we look for those business opportunities in case somebody's sitting out there and say, "I want to start my own business. I want to develop a product, or I want to develop something and maybe." Google will buy it or AWS will buy it. How can well, we think through that? Let me add, let me, let me give you an, another uh, example. Um, back in 2013 or so, when I was doing work for uh, Disney, I partnered up and, and, um, and took training to be a partner with Okta. And so I was, uh, this was before Okta was a public company. And because of my partnership with Okta and my introduction to um, and, and my introduction, my my introducing Okta to Disney, uh, I made a, a bundle of money from that introduction. Um, and so, uh, so my one one area is to uh, to if you want to go out on your own and and be a consultant, and I've done it for twenty five years uh, because I didn't want to work for a company. Um, I I um, I trained myself on hot technologies. Um, as Stefan just mentioned, if I was, uh, you know, maybe if I was uh, uh, starting off today, I'd look at Wiz and and I would train, uh, take training with Wiz, become a, a knowledgeable in their technology or others, right? And then uh, and then sell that service to uh, to to companies, and, and that's how I got my start um, and and grew my company by first growing my expertise in a particular area. And then selling my services to companies. You have to be able to sell. Anne Marie, you're gonna. Yeah. So for me, it was a little bit different because I would say because when I moved to Hawaii, I was working. I was living in Vegas. I was working at Zappos. I moved to Hawaii uh, because of Chuck, and I had to find an opportunity. And that's when I thought, okay, I want to start my own company. And coming up with what that company was. Um, I had to kind of think through it. And so I, I mean, I thought about landscaping companies. I thought of different things, 
but I thought, okay, what do, what's the lowest hanging fruit? What do I know? And the funny thing is I'm software development. I am not IT and I'm not cybersecurity, but I understand business and I understand tech enough, right? So I just, I just got a low hanging fruit where I thought, okay, I can start an MSP and it's because of my knowledge and then understanding the trends and seeing what the need is and understanding supply demand, right? There's, there's a demand for cybersecurity and that's when I pivoted and that's when we created CyberUptive. And actually we were outsourcing our SOC and then our SOC got bought out. And so that's how we decided to do it in house because we basically took the philosophy of at Zappos, I learned providing an exceptional experience for customers. And I noticed that other cybersecurity companies were not providing that level of service that we wanted. So that's when we decided, okay, there's a need we are going to create a company to fulfill this need. And so now, now that we have a SOC, we are finding other needs. And right now we're working on our own software. So starting an, uh, our own company and coming up with the ideas for companies has come from, I guess, from a need and being able to fulfill it. Yeah, I think Amory just said right there, you find a need and you fill it, right? So, and that's where the ideas for a lot of these firms come from. Mm -hmm. So going back to that, yeah. I think that's a probably a good place to end, right? So when we start businesses, work on projects, solve a real problem, solve a real need. And if somebody else is already doing it, just do it better with service, better service, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. There's tons of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid to fail. I, I want to throw that out there real quick. Fail and fail fast because you're going to fail. Just, just, but just do it and just get back up. Just keep going. Oh, yeah, we had multiple businesses, <laughs> right? So we've had multiple businesses that we failed that we we learned something from it. So absolutely, failure is is a must. You got to fail in order to succeed. Agreed. 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 Yep. Yeah. You have to fail in order to learn. Thank you to our panelists. I'm going to pass it back to Youngson. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Greg, for moderating this uh, stimulating, enlightening panel discussion. I'm not a tech person, so um, sometimes it was difficult for me to understand what you guys are talking about. But I still learned a lot from this fascinating conversation. Before we wrap up this webinar, I'd like to ask one question. You know, I teach in international business. I'm glad to hear the U.S. is ahead of the game in dealing with cybersecurity issues. You guys briefly touched on implications of multinational corporations conducting businesses across borders, mainly from legal perspective, compliance issues. But what would be your advice for MNCs to mitigate cybersecurity risk using AI in the global market? Is there anything that they could do a better job than the focused on just the purely domestic market? I, I think uh, Anne Marie mentioned that you know, different countries are going to have different cybersecurity needs. So you first have to understand where the country is in its need for cybersecurity and the different uh, businesses within that country, and then uh, and, and then approach it from that perspective. So what are the industries? Um, what are they doing to? What are the regulations related to those industries in that country? And then uh, how can you fulfill that need? Right. And that would also is go back to the legal part. Where does that data live? Does it live in the U.S. inside our models? Or is it in Canada? Or is it in Europe? Where is that data? Because you got data sovereignty laws. So, you know, wherever that country is, you know, they definitely got to understand what the risk impl implications as well. Okay. Where the data lives. Yeah, for me, I think what I would really like to see, especially doing business in these different countries, is I want to see an increase in education. So for instance, I'm going to have to open bank accounts in some of these countries, right? And I know that some of these countries, they cybersecurity is not on their on the forefront of their minds. And so my concern is with AI and knowing cases where people have used AI to to siphon money out of bank out of bank accounts and such. My fear is that these some of these countries aren't educated enough 
to understand what's happening with AI and the use of AI for fraudulent transactions. So I would like to see these countries become more educated and really understanding and understand the landscape. Okay. Yeah. Stephanie. And I would say, I would say kind of, you know, working with, um, working with international companies, we have to understand that, you know, sometimes they're not as modern as our American, as their American counterparts. So you have to be willing to work with systems, you know, lots of on-premises systems, lots of kind of legacy ways of working, but we have the tools, the modern tools now. So we can, even if they're using kind of old systems and old platforms, we have the tools now to, you know, improve their security posture. Um, and, you know, with AI, the defenders now have more, you know, because attackers around the world are using AI um, and defenders mostly coming from the US, but going right to the rest of the world are adopting AI for defenses. So just try to, I think, you know, as we're working across borders, we need to spread those modern defenses um, to, you know, other countries and other geographies because the attackers are consistent throughout the world with, you know, how they're attacking companies. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, our great panelists, Mark, Chuck, and Maria and Stefan, for sharing your experiences and insights with us about this very timely and important topic today. Finally, I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in two weeks titled Exploring the Future of U.S., Taiwan, and China Relations Under a Harris or Trump Administration. Please look for our emails to get more detailed information about these events. As you leave this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a short survey. I would really appreciate if you can give us a feedback to today's program. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.